So, two Sundays ago, we launched this study of the book of Colossians, and we're going to be in the first chapter today. If you want to go ahead and open up to the first chapter of Colossians, we're going to be studying a prayer today that Paul prayed for the young Christians that were in the city of Colossae. In fact, it might be a very good way to begin by asking you this question. If you could have anything that you wanted, what would you ask for? There was a fellow walking along the beach in Southern California, and he saw this old, rather ornate bottle wash up on the shore, and he picked it up, and out popped the requisite genie. The genie said, you probably know the routine. I'll give you anything that you ask for. What would you like? The fellow said, you know, I've always wanted to see Hawaii, but I'm deathly afraid of airplanes and boats, so I want you to build a highway all the way from Los Angeles to Hawaii. Jeannie said, I have never had a request like that. That is tough. And there's all kinds of environmental concerns and, and issues that are brought up. Are you sure you couldn't ask for something else? Well, all right, the guy said. Uh, I've always wanted to understand women. The genie said, do you want two lanes or four on that highway? <laughs> Think about it. If you could ask for anything that you wanted... Would you ask for understanding? What if God said, I'll, I'll give you anything that you want. Would you, would you ask for understanding? Because that very thing happened in the Bible. You might remember the story of young Solomon. Just after he assumed the throne of his father, David, God appeared to Solomon in a dream and he offered him that very thing. And to my knowledge, God has never offered it to anyone since or before. And it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 7, that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Now talk about a guy with a blank check. God, who made everything, offers anything to Solomon. And this is how Solomon responded in verse 10. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The, the first thing that Solomon asked for was the first thing that Paul prayed for when he interceded for the new Christians that were around the world. You see, we're asking this question throughout this series. How do you become a spiritually mature person? And the issue in Colossians is, where is the path to true spirituality? Is Christ enough or do you need more? Paul believed that an increase in maturity is going to depend on an increase in wisdom. And he also believed that kind of wisdom was available for the asking. So our text, Colossians chapter 1, beginning in the 19th verse, we read these words. Follow along in your own Bible. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, Let me ask you a question that we started to talk about last week a little bit. How do you pray for people that you know are doing very well? I mean, we know how to pray for people who are hurting. We know how to pray for people who are sick or who are grieving. But what Paul is saying, according to the first few verses of Colossians that we looked at last week, that these people are doing very well. They are growing in faith and hope and love, and they are bearing fruit. And Paul is hearing very good things about them. So how do you pray for people like that? What you do, I hope, is you pray for their continued spiritual maturity. 
And Paul understands that Satan is going to try to impede the growth of people that are doing well. And what they need then is understanding. Write this down. Maturity is impeded when believers are not filled with spiritual wisdom. Paul said, you know what you need right now more than anything else? I want God to give you an increased capacity to think spiritually. Look at verse 9 again from the Living Bible in Colossians chapter 1. So, ever since we first heard about you, we have kept on praying and asking God to help you understand what he wants you to do. Asking him to make you wise about spiritual things. Now, if you'll study Paul's writings, you'll find this is very consistent. He consistently prays a prayer that God would fill Christians around the world with a capacity to think spiritually. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, Paul wrote, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I'm going to contend this morning, this is just my judgment, but I believe the greatest weakness in most churches today is that so many members in most churches are infantile in their understanding of spiritual things. I heard a minister tell a story one time about taking his family on vacation to Florida They pulled into a place to have breakfast just outside of Tampa, Florida. All the way down there, everywhere they could see, everywhere they could look, they saw orange trees. In fact, this particular roadside restaurant was right across the street from a very large orange grove. So they ordered their breakfast, and he asked for some orange juice. The waitress said, I'm sorry, I can't give you any orange juice. He said, why can't I have orange juice? She said, well, our machine is broken. Now, he's sitting there literally a few yards from millions of oranges, but nobody knows how to get orange juice because the machine is broken. And he went on to make the point. I I wonder if that's how it is in the church where I preach. Nobody knows how to nourish themselves. Nobody knows how to nourish and drink deep from the spiritual life of God unless the preacher stands up in the pulpit and feeds them like babies. You see... The false teachers in Colossae were promoting the idea that if the people would listen to them, then they would get the rest of the, 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 the knowledge that the Christians didn't have, and they would really be in the know then. And Paul's going to say, no way, you are in Christ, and in Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I want you to be filled with wisdom, not just just a few people filled, but all of you. Look at what he says a little later in the letter in chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Now when he says dwell in you, that you is plural. Where I grew up, we would say y'all. Now, what does it mean to be filled with wisdom and understanding? That word is used all over your New Testament to talk about being controlled by something. For example, in the Gospels, it says that the people were filled with awe when Jesus did miracles. Or it says the Pharisees were filled with rage when Jesus healed on the Sabbath. It says the disciples were filled with sorrow on the night that Jesus died. And we have a similar expression in our language. We call it under the influence. And if you can say that somebody is under the influence, that means that they are being controlled by something. Now what Paul is saying is this, I am praying for you that you will live your lives under the influence of the wisdom of God. Let me take you, uh, just tell you just a second um, what he is not praying for. First, write this down, he's not praying that we will baptize secular wisdom spiritual wisdom is not baptized secular wisdom 
And we do this all the time. We, we take the wisdom of the world and we go to the university, we get their textbooks, we sprinkle a couple of Christian words into it, and we call that Christian, but it's not. You go to a counselor, and that counselor pulls out Freud or Roger or Skinner and says a little prayer at the end. That's not Christian counseling. That is just secular counseling that's tried to be baptized. We do it with the way even that we grow our churches. We, we take the marketing strategies of business and Fortune 500 companies and we say a little prayer at the end and we call that church growth. We do this all the time. We take the wisdom of the world and we try to baptize it. That is not what Paul is praying for. Paul has a very clear difference in mind between the wisdom of this world and the spiritual wisdom that God only gives to the people that are in Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. Paul writes, This is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially in our relations with you, in the holiness and sincerity that are from God. We have done so not according to worldly wisdom, but according to God's grace. Paul makes a very clear line. I have not done my ministry based on the wisdom from this world. Look what he writes in 1 Corinthians 2. <clears throat> we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or, or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. We've not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. To be filled with spiritual wisdom means that you are filled with the Holy Spirit who is guiding and illuminating your thoughts. Do you remember what the apostles said when they were having trouble getting food to all of the widows? They said, go out and find men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Spiritual wisdom is not baptized secular wisdom. It is a unique gift from God that only people who are in Christ can have. Secondly, write this down. Spiritual wisdom is more than Bible knowledge. Don't get me wrong. Spiritual wisdom always involves knowledge of the scriptures. But study of the scripture does not always result in spiritual insight. If it did, why would Paul need to pray? Have you ever thought about that? If, if all you needed to do was to have spiritual wisdom is to just have the facts of the Bible, then Paul would have written a letter and just said, read this. But what he did was pray and then send a letter. He prayed that God would grant spiritual understanding. I think that all of us can think of times in our lives where we were in the presence of people that could recite enormous amounts of Bible facts, but their lives were not filled with wisdom. You can be filled with the Word of God without being filled with the wisdom that God grants through the Word. Information does not always result in illumination. So let's understand when Paul says, here's my prayer. If I could give you one thing, if I could ask God for one thing, I would ask you to be filled with spiritual wisdom. He's not talking about baptizing secular wisdom or just knowing facts about the Bible. He's talking about a gift that only comes from God, a gift controlled by the Holy Spirit, a gift that enables you to think spiritually, a way of thinking that people that do not have Christ don't have and honestly cannot understand. Now, I want you to show you three examples of what that kind of wisdom looks like, because what, what Paul does is, is he says in verse 9, I want you to have wisdom. And then in verse 10, he says, we pray this in order that. So what he's going to do is, is show you three examples of why spiritual wisdom is critical. So, so keep your Bibles open. Colossians 1. Look what it says. Oops, I, I moved too fast on that. Number 1, or Colossians 1 verse 10. We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And here's the first thing. He says, wisdom 
will stop associating good works with works righteousness. If you believe that your standing with God is merited by your deeds, you are lacking in understanding. And we try to make that very clear from this particular pulpit. You do not earn your status with God by deeds. Let me tell you something else. If you de-emphasize the importance of doing good works in Jesus' name, then you think foolishly too. Spiritual wisdom does not produce a life of pride. It produces a life of love. And wisdom understands that good works do not earn eternal life. They are the result of God's life coursing through the believer. All through your Bible, the metaphor for works is fruit. If you plant a tree that is a fruit tree, does the fruit tree have to produce fruit to become a fruit tree? No. It produces fruit because it's a fruit tree. And you don't produce work so that you can become a Christian or become right with God. You produce works because you are right with God. And his life is flowing through you. And it is the will and wisdom of God to create a people who are his feet and his hands and his lips to the world. Look what Paul writes in Ephesians 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. There is no book in the New Testament that condemns works righteousness more than the book of Galatians. And look at how Paul closes that book in the last few verses. He says in Galatians 6, 9, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Spiritual wisdom understands that there is not a tension in the New Testament between grace and works. The tension in the New Testament is between grace and merit. You cannot merit your understanding or your standing, excuse me, with God on any other basis in faith in the blood of Jesus Christ to cover your life. But to go from that thinking that because we cannot merit our standing with God, then works and fruits are unimportant. That, then, is foolishness. And listen, don't equate good works with only church works. Works are anything that we do in real-life situations to be the hands and feet and heart of God to somebody else. In fact, if it doesn't issue in real-life helping of other people, then it isn't wisdom. I talked about happy days last week. How about this? Do you remember Gilligan's Island? Do you remember they're on the island because their boat was shipwrecked? Do you remember the character, the professor? He was amazing. He could forecast weather. He could measure the thermal heat of volcanoes. In real life, his name was Russell Johnson. After the show, he made a living by going around the country to different Gilligan's Island conventions and Comic-Con appearances. He said the single question he was asked more than any other question, every time he met somebody, they seemed to ask this question. If you could make a radio out of a coconut, why couldn't you fix the boat? If wisdom doesn't issue into practical, real-life, hands-on helping of people, then it is not God's wisdom. God's wisdom isn't the kind of wisdom that sits off in an ivory tower spouting theological treatises. No, God's wisdom is down on a street helping people live their lives closer to him. That's why Paul said, I'm praying that you have wisdom. Look at verse 10 again from the message. We pray that you'll live well for the master, making him proud of you as you work hard in his orchard. As you learn more and more how God works, you will learn how to do your work. That's what he's saying. The more you grow in who God is, the more you know how to be an ambassador for God. And if you don't tell someone you, you don't tell someone who is wise 
by their words as much as you do by their deeds. Wisdom will stop associating good works with works righteousness. Secondly, and write this down, wisdom will stop assuming that living with power means living without pain. Look at verse 11. This is the next reason why Paul wanted them to have wisdom. He says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. Now think about that. I want you to be filled with power so that you will have endurance and patience. Wait a second, Paul. When I think of God's power and when I think of his might, I don't think about suffering. A lot of people, and I think they speak foolishly when they speak this way, but a lot of people talk about God's power so that you won't have pain or you won't have suffering. I don't think that's what the Bible says. Dave Dravecki was the pitcher for the San Francisco Giants. He got cancer in his pitching arm. He tried to make a comeback. One day he's up on the mound, and you may remember this back when this occurred, but he was throwing the pitch, and as he did, his arm broke, and you could hear his arm break as he threw the pitch. The cancer had came back, and he had to give up his career. But it was through that turmoil that Dave Dravecki actually came to Jesus Christ. And he wrote a book, and the book was entitled, When You Can't Come Back. He said, one night a woman came up to me, and she told me how she was down and out with a drug addiction until somebody had told her about Jesus Christ. And she became a Christian, and she was healed of her addiction. And she told me that God wanted all of his children to be 100% healthy. Dave Dravecki asked, but does he? What would God's children grow up to be like if all of the bumps in the road ahead were just smoothed out? Cancer introduced me to suffering, and suffering is what strengthened my faith. Yet the woman implied I was suffering because I didn't have enough faith. She seemed to be saying if I had enough faith, I could get the life I wanted. But that struck me as to making God into some kind of cosmic vending machine where if you push the right button, you get a sweet life free of suffering. Someone once said that the difference between American Christianity and Christianity as it's practiced in many other parts of the world has to do with how each views suffering. In America, Christians pray for the burden of suffering to be lifted from their backs. In other parts of the world, Christians pray for stronger backs so that they can bear their suffering. One of the things that wisdom understands is that if God wants to show the world that he is mighty and that he is powerful, one of the best ways he can do that is from the platform of pain. You remember the Apostle Paul speaking about his thorn in the flesh it was some kind of a physical malady that, that caused a great struggle in his life. And, and he prayed and prayed that God would take it away. And this is what he learned. He writes in 2 Corinthians 12. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, I am strong. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen the power of God manifested in weakness? Because if you have not, you have not learned to think spiritually yet. I see the power of God every single time I see Jennifer Hooger. Every time I see some of you in the church dealing with incredible pain or struggles or adversity, from this platform of pain, God is preaching a sermon that, that sometimes people can't hear any other way. I'm going to suggest to you that pain and suffering reveal who has God's wisdom and who does not. Look again at verse 11 from the message. We pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives. It is the strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. Someone asked C.S. Lewis one time, why do the righteous suffer? His reply, why not? 
They're the only ones who can handle it. And wisdom stops assuming that living with power means living without pain. Let me show you one more thing that wisdom does. Write this down. Wisdom stops asking for salvation and starts basking in it. Look again at verse 12 in Colossians 1. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Now, we've talked a lot about what Paul prays, but notice what he does not pray for. Paul does not pray for the qualifications as citizens in the kingdom of God to come because you don't ask God for something that he has already actually done. All the conditions have been met for you to receive eternal inheritances from the Father. And I'm going to suggest to you that sometimes our prayers reveal our lack of understanding because we're still begging God to do something he's already done. Look at verses 13 and 14 again. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The metaphor that Paul uses there doesn't really connect well in our culture, but it did in theirs. In that day, people understood that when an army came into a country and they conquered through a war, those people, they would take these captives, pick them up and take them literally to another country, just like the Jews were taken to Babylon. Now, the difference is they didn't want to be taken, but we do. We are in the kingdom of darkness, the Bible says. Through the work of Jesus Christ, God has come along and he has rescued us and he has picked us up and he has transferred us over into the kingdom of light, to the kingdom that we have always wanted to be in. Now that's what God has already done. And that's why Paul is not praying for God to do it. He is praying for them to understand that God has done it because it makes a, pardon the expression, huge difference how you live your life once you understand what kind of a kingdom you're actually a citizen of. Our redemption is a present possession. Ephesians 1, Paul writes, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Now, why did God have to give us wisdom and understanding when he gave us redemption? Here's why. Because he knew that Satan was going to come along and Satan was going to tell us we don't actually have redemption. He knew that Satan would come and whisper in your ear, I'll bet you're really not saved. I'll bet you're really not forgiven. There's no way that the God above will have forgotten what you did. Aren't you ashamed still? God knew that Satan was going to do that. So the Bible says that he didn't just give us redemption. He also gave us and lavished on us wisdom. So that we would be ready when Satan's going to say the things that he says. You see... Spiritual wisdom does not base assurance of salvation on feelings. It is based on the understanding of God's revealed word. Heard a story of a guy driving through the Midwest and he's needing directions and he stops his car as a guy out in the field on his tractor. And he hollers, hey buddy, can you tell me how to get to St. Louis? The guy on the tractor said, nope. Can you tell me how to get to Kansas City? Guy says, nope. Well, if I keep driving down this country road, what's the first town I'm going to come to? Guy says, I don't know. Man, the car is really perturbed, but he says, you don't know much, do you? Farmer looks back, he says, I know I ain't lost. (laughs) And spiritual wisdom starts right there. I know I ain't lost. I have my redemption and my inheritance is guaranteed. I have been qualified by God. And the Bible says that kind of understanding is available for the asking. So I want to close this morning by asking, is that what you want more than anything else from God? Do you want to learn to think spiritually? You see, I believe what is needed is more prayer for wisdom. I'm not knocking Bible study, 
I have never known a spiritually wise person that did not have knowledge of the scriptures, but I have known a lot of people with knowledge of scripture that were not spiritually wise. Paul understood that the knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's mind comes from the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul prayed as much as he preached. And, and I got to be honest with you, when I was a baby preacher, I preached more than I prayed. And even though I had a Bible college degree and I, I worked halfway through my master's degree and, and I had all this Bible knowledge, I had increasing frustration in real life situations to speak truth that would make things better in people's lives. It took me a while to learn that what I really need, I was never going to get until I actually asked for it. See, the brother of Jesus writes, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. If we have not, it is because we ask not. God loves to hear our prayers, folks. But do you know what he particularly delights in? It's when you ask for understanding. By September of that year, a lump had developed on the outside of my left arm that was now half the size of a golf ball. I'm getting ready for spring training in 1981, and the next thing you know, um, I'm traded in spring training with two days left to the San Diego Padres. But you know what was really cool? It was there that I met my roommate, Byron Ballard, and Byron uh, became the guy in my life that challenged me to read the Bible. August 27th, 1981, my wife and I were baptized by Roy Wheeler. It was, of all places in Amarillo, Texas, the most beautiful place in the universe for Jan and I, and the most amazing experience of our life uh, that began a journey that, that has been a very interesting journey, to say the least. Getting to the big leagues and and now being a major league ball player, experiencing an all-star game in the World Series, and, and then getting traded from the San Diego Padres, which were a last place team, to the first place Giants, and you know, and going into postseason play in 87 against the Cardinals, and pitching the two best games of my life. And I thought, man, 1988's gonna be my year. We're sitting there and the doctors on the outside of the room start flipping the films under the lights to examine them. And all of a sudden we heard one of the guys say, man, this is a tumor. And my heart went into my throat. I said, look, I can't sit back and forget about, you know, at least attempting to come back. I don't want to live the rest of my life wondering. I went to the bullpen and there was a standing ovation. I was like, wait a minute, man, I'm just Dave Dravecki. And then I get out to the mound and I'm just overwhelmed by all these things that are happening. And, and the game starts and I complete eight innings. Um, in this victory against the Cincinnati Reds. It's a couple hours before the game, sitting there talking with Bob Nepper over uh, um, pregame lunch, and we start talking about the comeback and how awesome it was and this incredible miracle. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there and he looks at me and he goes, I hate to burst your bubble, man, but it's not the miracle of the comeback here that's so important. He said, it's the miracle of salvation. It's the day you met Jesus that is so important in all of this. And what God has done is given you a platform through baseball to share his love with those who hurt. And five hours later, I'm laying on the ground with a broken arm. And all I could hear were Bob Nepper's words. The cancer reoccurred. Um, there were more surgeries. With each surgery, there were less and less margin to be able to remove anything, because now they were down to bone.
and I felt so much pressure to be an example for others. I entered into an identity crisis. I went into clinical depression. Then I became a very angry man because I did not know how to deal with these emotions that I had pushed and pushed and pushed. It was horrible. As a result of some really good friends who loved me in spite of my behavior, God began to heal. And it's hard even to admit those things, but there's been great healing in being able to expose the lies of my life, the hiddenness of my life. Because in that freedom, I've come face to face with true grace, that love that comes even on my worst day. The most loving, the most gracious, the most understanding, the most encouraging, the most forgiving person in the universe and in my life.